Welcome back to Sunday Morning Quickies, episode 118 for the 5th of May, 2024. I'm going to try something a little different this week. I'm going to be working on this motor made by the Delco Appliance Division of General Motors. Um, and uh, I'm going to try doing that wearing gloves. If I'm, if I'm successful, then you're going to see orange hands from here on out. Because getting the crud from these from these motors off your hands is always a bit of a challenge. These are uh, seven mil Hardy brand, which is comes out of Harbor Freight, um, in this extremely bright orange. But they have this ribbed surface on them, and um, we'll see. We'll see if these work out. You know, I've, I'm going to see if I can survive with them. If you see my hands in a few minutes, you'll know it wasn't a success. Before we get going too much, I wanted to show you uh, a couple of tools that um, I find extremely helpful. Um, everybody knows what tweezers are, and most people have, you know, one or two sets of tweezers. Pair? I don't know. Is it a pair of tweezers? Is it a single tweeze? I don't know what the what the actual nomenclature would be. Anyway, um, I buy my tweezers through McMaster Car. Uh, they've got an excellent se uh, selection of industrial and surgical quality um, tweezers. Uh, this particular one I find extremely handy. It's uh, five inches long, bent tip, very sharply pointed. These are five BCCs. These are, I find these indispensable, especially when working on motors. Um, it's not going to make much difference on this one because this one does not have grease wicks. But on the can style motors, when you have to get the grease wicks in and out of the little posts, these get you in and out really nicely. Um, this particular pair of straight tweezers, I'm not sure the exact model number on this. I'll look it up from previous purchases and I'll put it in the doobly-doo down below. This is another one that I, uh, that I use a lot. Um, these are invaluable when you're trying to move small parts around or small um, small screws especially. Now a lot of you have seen these um, screw starters. These were given to me by Harlan, uh, one of our viewers. He got these, I believe he was, uh, I don't remember if it was IBM or Smith Corona typewriter repairman. Uh, but regardless, these he got uh, from the typewriter repair industry. These are HJJ co Company out of Los Angeles. I do believe they are now defunct. These are very, very nice. And Harlan, I can't thank you enough. Harlan was the one that turned me on to using screw starters like this. Prior to that, I was a firm believer in using the five-prong jewel, uh, jewel pickers. Um, which, yeah, they still work great. You can pick up screws and stuff like that. You can get things in position with them. But it's not nearly as nice as screw starters. Since then, I have expanded my screw starter collection. And there's a lot more beyond this. I've got a bunch more in my field kit and more in a cabinet across the way. Um, this one here, the um, these, these are Quick Wedge. I bought these through uh, McMaster Car. This 1836 model, uh, model 1836, this one is great for um, holding the, the mounting screws for uh, potted motors to get them down into there and, and, and get them started. Um, these, you don't drive screws with these, you, you start screws with this. And how it works, um, you take a screw, you put it you, you well you find you you select the correct screw starter for the size you put the screw in and then you slide the little barrel here and what it does is it put it wedges the uh, screw the, the the screw starter onto the head i've got various sizes i've got various configurations uh well let me grab another one out of the cabinet here um you can find the right drawer and of course it's going to be the last drawer i open yep there's a bunch of them here um, I've got even more now because I've kind of turned into a screw starter junkie. 
Um, this one is this. This is a different design. Let me show you. Take one for a straight uh, line for straight screws here. This you literally uh, you twist this, and the center section retracts, and then you put the put the screw on it. You push it in, and the center section uh, the center piece comes out. Oops, sorry. The center piece comes out and turns and locks onto the screw. There's this style for straights. Uh, it's also available for Phillips. Um, this is a 2556. It's yet another big one of the, the wedge styles from, um, from Quick Wedge. So yeah, I've got oodles and oodles of screw stars that um, if it wasn't for Harlan, I would have still been using the uh, springy thingies. And don't get me wrong, these, these do work and they work well, but they're nothing compared to screw starters. Screw starters is the way to go, uh, for my money anyway. So, the last thing I want to pull up on the table are these crocodile ear polypuses. Now, uh, I know it's a goofy sounding name. This is actually a surgical instrument used by uh, physicians who are doing nasal and ear surgery and stuff like that or when they have to get in uh, to a restricted area you'll note the action when you when you when you uh, move the uh, the handles this whole top piece pivots and it triggers the the very end which opens like a crocodile jaw. This is a three and a half. I've had this one for well over 30 years. Liz got this for me a long time ago for use in model making and model railroading. Uh, this is a more recent acquisition. This is a five inch and I, I, I find these to be invaluable. Um, if you have a serger that does not have uh, automatic threading and you're not really great with tweezers, these can help save your butt on that. But I use these a lot in reassembly of machines. Um, it lets me get into areas that are very difficult um, just to, to hold a screw in position where I can't use a screw starter to get it going. Uh, they're just invaluable for small parts positioning and holding. So I wholeheartedly recommend finding these. Um, they're available on Amazon. There's various models. Well, this one's got a little crud in there at the moment. Um, I believe the one that Liz gave me 30 some odd years ago, she got from the company Micromark. They specialize in stuff for model builders. But um, I wholeheartedly recommend having at least one set of crocodile ear polypuses. Okay, it's time to look at this motor. Um, like I said, this is made by Delco Appliance Division of the General Motors Corporation, made in Rochester, New York, in USA. Um, anyway, it is a 0.9 ampere motor, uh, 115 volt AC. Now, the uh, this is not obviously a Singer motor, but you see these on a lot of machines that were converted to, uh, you know, old Singer machines that were converted from either treadle or hand crank. And I think you can see the condition of this wiring. It's, it's, an, it's, an, it's abysmal. So I'm just going to go ahead and cut this off, complete with all of the crap that's on there, all the uh, electrical tape and whatnot. We will come back to this later. I'm going to cut it off from the foot controller as well and just toss this mess. And um, we're going to go ahead. I'm not going to worry about the foot controller right now. I'm only going to worry about the motor. But uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take this motor apart. And I'm going to show you a couple of things that uh, might be handy in the future. So we'll start by taking off the pulley which in this case, just one set screw, it comes right off. The motor is, is uh, shaft is a D-style shaft, so it's got a flat on it for the set screw. No big deal, easy to come, easy come, easy go. And uh, let's find what size nut driver we need for the back end of this. 
and I'm not going to get lucky just finding one right out of the box. So, looks like a quarter inch nut driver will work nicely. So we, we're going to need that, but first thing we're going to do is we're going to take off this uh, bracket that attached the, the motor to the sewing machine. We'll just pull that off. I'm not going to do a, uh, a full quote-unquote restoration. I'm not going to strip the paint off this and repaint it, although it definitely needs it and deserves it. These are good little motors. I will get some of the crud off of here. I don't know what that is. It's not on a doorknob or something. But I'm trying to get that kind of peeled off. It's coming. Not sure what it is. It's chipping off just with my finger. So let me see if I can find a plastic, something plastic I can use to scrape it. We have this old cam here. Before anybody freaks out, this cam has got a bad center on it. Okay, that's close enough for now. If we were doing a full restoration, we would go a little bit more nuts. Okay, this motor is held together with two big screws that go through the whole length, and then there are nuts on the back. We're going to take the nuts off to disassemble, leaving the, the front of the screws connected, because inside the back of this, you're going to see in a moment, there's going to be more screws on the threaded rod that goes through the motor as I get this apart. Yeah, all this wire here is in really bad shape. You know what we're going to do? We're just going to we're going to cut that a little bit more flush with the uh, housing here, just to facilitate getting this out. All right, and we'll slip that off. All right, looks like the front end is going to want to come off first. There we go, and. There we go. Now you'll see those big long screws. They go through the brush holders here, or so they, uh, the plates for the brush holders. So I prefer to take off the back end first, but that's not the way it wanted to come. There we go. We got the back end off. Now there's a washer that belongs on this end of the shaft, which we'll put it in place. And see if there's any washers from the front. No washers on the front. And we have the armature assembly. I'll put that washer back. Let's double check. And the fan blade's in good condition. You can see, though, that our commutators are pretty gunked up. So, how are we going to handle this? Well, first thing... Ooh, somebody has been in here before. We're going to do a little dissection here and uh, see if we can get this crud, this old tape, off of here and find out how bad the glob of solder is under this mess. I fear it's going to be... Oh, it's not as bad as I feared. Okay. I'll take that as a success. That's actually... Ah, I see what they did when they made this. The two conductors both go in on the one, the one coil and there's a jumper wire that goes across from the factory. So we're going to have to attack this a little differently than I would most of the motors that were made by Singer. But newsflash, I can work in these gloves. So far anyway. All right. This might be the end of filthy fingers for Bob. Or at least while working on motors. Both of these wires here are pretty cruddied up. There's still some cloth insulation left on this. I want to flush this off with some um, with some con with some uh, electronic contact cleaner. I've got some paper towels in the bottom of my waste can. So I want to flush that off a little bit. 
just to get some of the gooey, sticky stuff off. See if that made a damn dang bit of difference here. And not really. Okay. You'll notice the, the brushes are still in the brush holders on the plate. I'm kind of trying to be a little careful with how I maneuver all of this. And these wires, yes, are very sticky at the moment. The cleaning off with the uh, contact cleaner helped a bit, but it's not perfect. So I'm just going to use a uh, wire cutter to kind of like lightly go across here, scraping to get some of this crap off of here. There's little bits of the uh, of wrapped cloth insulation still on here. And I want to try to minimize how much is going through. All right. Isn't that delightful? All right, I'm scraping this crap off. All right. Um, all right, let me spray that with a little bit more contact cleaner. If I can do it without a cat getting in the way. Okay, that looks a bit cleaner. Uh, I'm going to pause for just a minute. Believe it or not, I'm going to wash my hands in the gloves to see if I can get some of this crap off the gloves. Right back. Okay, Bob's a happy guy. I went to the kitchen sink, a little bit of warm water and Dawn, and the majority of the, well, there's some areas I didn't hit, but the majority of it all came off. These are the gloves I'm talking about. These are available at Harbor, Harbor, uh, Harbor Freight. Uh, the textured grip nitriles are seven mil thick. Uh, you're going to be seeing me in these a lot from here on out. Um, my concern was that I was never going to be able to clean them during the day, and I didn't want to sit here and change gloves, you know, a half a dozen times a day. So. Um, this is a game changer for me. All right, let me grab some wire. All right, I pulled out my uh, ECG soldering station. This is JSSD2, uh, temperature controlled. It's, it, it's really nice, and it's got much better temperature control than I would get using my soldering gun, which I have been using way too much on motors. And I want to set a little bit better example by using a much better soldering iron. So I'm going to try, at least for, for now, to do as many motors videos as I can using a legit soldering station. So, but before we get going here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to strip back about an inch and a half, two inches of uh, insulation on my black and red wires and twist them back. There's one. Let me get the other here. And here's the red. And uh, now I want to take a little, I'm going to twist these up, get them twisted together. And I'm going to put some little pieces of shrink tubing on that and uh, actually shrink it in place. So I'm bring my heat gun down, get that in position. And all right, I've got some 1 16th inch inner diameter shrink tube. I'm going to cut two little tiny pieces of it and see if I can get this wire through it. Uh, that might be easier said than done. All right, let's twist it up and turn that off. Well, I got one on. It's all the way back. And let's hit that with some heat. Okay. 
Okay. Incidentally, I did a uh, I did a house call today where I went to a uh, person's house and I rewired her 99 that's in a cabinet right in her sewing room and um, I didn't change didn't have to change the internal wiring it was just it was um, one of the motors that has the little compartment underneath so I just the other wiring was in good shape so I just put new power leads on and um, added uh, made, made new wires for the uh, foot control but whole job didn't take very long and it was an extremely rewarding operation alright I've got two little pieces that didn't come didn't play nice I'm going to just break off here there we go alright it's nice and clean I want to get a meter on this just to see how we're looking put that in the continuity scale I just want to make sure that we don't have any short circuits going on. And we do not. I want to make sure that this wire is separate from that, seeing how they were stripped so close to each other. Yeah, with no brushes touching each other. Yeah, we have no continuity between the two coils. Let's make sure that we have con good uh, connection on one coil. Oops, it was this one. Okay, that's that's this coil here. So the other one should be from the other coil. And it is. It's good. All right. So we don't have any short circuits in the windings there. So we'll be fine. I don't often check that kind of stuff ahead of time, and I should every time I do this. But, you know, sometimes you get a little lazy. And uh, sometimes when you get lazy, it comes back and it bites you in the butt. So, anyway, we're almost 10 minutes in on this, on this segment here. So, let me uh, go ahead. I'm going to, that's way too much wire stripped back. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to wrap the first wire nice and tight. I've got some solder and my soldering iron. Tin up the tip of it a little bit. There we go. So we'll get some heat going on this and we'll flow some solder in. I'm going to have to learn how to use my soldering iron with gloves. And there we go, that's off. And I can reach up, I can reach my red shrink tube. I'm going to shrink these as we go. And that's cool. I put these, made these wires extremely long. Uh, I'm only going to put a short piece of shrink tube on to, uh, to make a cable out of this. Uh, I can always add more because I don't know what this what this motor is going to wind up being where it's going to wind up going so I'll shrink this one in that's good a layer like that you don't need that much wire hanging out so trim that off a little bit and go ahead I'm going to wrap this one oops come on come on there we go there nice and tight I know there are those that do this differently. Um, you know, your mileage may vary on how you make this connection. Uh, I know my friend Jennifer does it pretty much the same way I do, and she does a lot of motors as well. Uh, okay, here we go. Get some solder flowing onto the joint. And we'll grab some 
eighth inch black to cover that most recent joint. I have hanging above my shop light between the ch uh, but going between the chains I've got a piece of 14 gauge uh, house wire and on there I've got four spools of um, eighth inch shrink tube there's clear white actually five spools clear white red uh, black and yellow and then I have a spool of the um, black 3 16 that's what I use to make the cable out of the stuff um, unless I'm putting more than two conductors at which you know time I'll go with a larger even larger heat shrink so I just if you see me reaching up and pulling stuff down that's what it is and before we do a wide shot I've got to go and I've got to rewind it because half this stuff is hanging literally right above my head right now. Okay, we have our wires intact. I'm going to move these brushes and the springs for the brushes out of the way. I'm going to move the armature, uh, I mean the field coil out of the way. We're going to address this armature assembly. Actually, I'm going to take this washer off before we lose it. Um, it's pretty funky, it's pretty dirty. So let me grab something from the other side of the room because rather than using my bench motor to clean, polish, and level this, we're going to do this with a uh, cordless drill. Be right back. One of the reasons why I'm one of the few guys you'll ever know that has a credit card at Sally's Beauty is because I buy a lot of these nail files, these foam core nail files. They're not super cheap, and I buy a boatload of them at a time. Uh, I was in the store a couple of weeks back and spent like $83 on nail files. That's a lot of nail files. And... Um, the young lady at the counter at the checkout but I digress anyway uh, she advised me that if I were to uh, get a Sally's um, apply for a Sally's credit card that um, my purchase oh because it was over fifty dollars I would save twenty bucks so I don't know if they're running that right now or not but I took advantage of it it was a one-time thing but um, anyway, yeah, so the ones I like the most, I start out, well, I, I do have some that are coarser than this, but this is my default starting point. Um, this side, the back is 220 grit, the front side is 320, and then I go to this one, the back side is 400, the front side is 600, then I go to this one here, um, the back side, excuse me, the, the, the dark side here is 600, this goes to um, 9,000, and then this one goes to 12, excuse me, 4,000, and this one goes to 12,000. So, um, that's all well and good, but it's not going to work on these size uh, commutator bars. These, as they sit, work great on potted motors. So, what to do, what to do, what to do. I take one of these things every once in a while in the various sizes as I need to and I take them out to the wood shop out in the garage and I take them to the bandsaw and I rip them to a different width. Now I could do this with a utility knife and a steel straight edge. It would work exactly the same. I own a 14 inch bandsaw. I'm sorry, I'm using the bandsaw. So let's grab a drill. This is my Milwaukee uh, 18 volt that I've had since forever. And I'm going to chuck it, chuck the main shaft. Oops, you know what? Helps to, there we go. Chuck it into the, the shaft, into the, uh, into the drill chuck. There we go. We're just gonna tighten that up. All right, now. It's not running super straight, super smooth. It's an old drill, but that's okay. I'm going to use the coarse side of the blue one, the um, two, was it was a 220, I believe, 220 side. Now I normally do this in the bench motor. 
and use the, the, the medium side on that, which is the 320. And I'm not using a lot of pressure, I'm just going side to side. But you can see most of the crud is off it. Now we'll go to the 400 grit. This one's a little wider, I don't have to move side to side nearly as much. Then we'll go to the 600 grit. That's looking a lot better. Uh, we'll stay with the 600 on this. And we'll swing this around to the 4000 side. Now, I'm not going to edit this. This is all going to be in real time. And now the 12000 side so for a final polish. Okay, now let me get this out of the drill, get the drill out of the way. And uh, you can see how nice and clean and polished those commutator bars are now. This motor is going to run so much better, but I got to flush it. So I got to get any uh, trace of any copper from that. So I'm holding it over a garbage can. I've got some quick drying contact cleaner and I'm just going to flush that off with the contact cleaner and any any metal filings left over from the cleaning process are falling down into the paper towels down in my can here so and I'll just wipe that off very carefully wipe that off Unlike Singer motors, these are not potted in epoxy here. So you got to be wicked careful when you're handling this. It's real easy to damage something like this. Okay. So there you go. That's all I'm going to do to this armature assembly. As you can see here, that looks pretty darn good. So we're going to leave that alone. Alright, so we're going to put this puppy back together again. So I'm just going to put a short chunk of 3 16 shrink tube on this. It's only like an inch. I'm going to bring that down here and get all these wires together. See if 3 16 will fit over all that. It might not. Well, it goes far enough. It'll make it through the hole. And that's what counts. I'm going to shrink that down. And I know I've mentioned this in the past. I have sung the praises of this 20 volt heat gun. Um, right now, I would be lost without it. I, I absolutely love that heat gun. Okay, now looking inside here, there is no uh lubrication wick or anything on on inside this bearing it's not the way this one was made the fan goes in that side so i've got to run this through here first because that's where the business end of this motor is that's where the cooling end is so see i'm not as i'm not quite all there sometimes. There we go. We got it in. Make sure that that's not hitting on anything. It doesn't appear to be. I can look in and I don't see the wires in danger of being hitting into the fan blades. I'm going to stop here and save us a little bit of time. Uh, this is already running pretty long. You remember earlier, like when we were first taking this motor apart, how the wiring was all chowdered up? Well, it was quite obvious that somebody had been in this motor much earlier in its life. And it was at this point in the reassembly process that I realized whoever put this motor back together again put it together completely wrong. Um, those screws should be coming through the back side of the case, not from the front side of the case, because there should be nuts that hold... Uh, the, 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 the screws should come up, go through the spacers, and there should be nuts that hold the um, brush holder plate in place before the front cover goes on, or I should say the, the, the pulley side cover goes on. And um, 
there was some missing hardware. There were some missing uh, fiber washers at, that are used as uh, uh, to adjust the height of the standoff so that the um, uh, solder connection portion of the commutators weren't banging up against the um, the back of the brush plate. There was a whole bunch of stuff that was going on. I'm going to spare you everything, all the drama, the hour and a half of drama of getting that all back together. And we're going to pick this up at the point where I'm able to put the cover back on. Uh, I had just let you know, I wound up making some, I didn't have fiber washers I could use to make spacers. I actually used brass washers that I had to hold in the pair of pliers, take to the bench grinder and grind them down to get to a certain shape. Suffice it to say, I got all that working. We'll pick it up with getting the motor, the final assembly, getting the covers back on, and um, we'll take it from there. Is it going to clear the body now? It looks like it will. Let's find out. Because this is getting really freaking old. Here we go. That's going on. And give her a little tappy tap tap. Hey, look at that. That's moving. I'm going to put one nut on this. And uh, I'm going to have to dig up, well, I've got the square one, I guess I can use that. That's much larger than quarter inch. I used the original nuts that were on the outside. I used them to hold the brush plate inside in position. Because um, otherwise, uh, I don't want to use the expression I'm thinking. But I was moving something against the tie. And I think I was shoveling something against the tide. And I think you can figure out what that is. So here we are. She's turning. Actually, she sounds like she's running really strong. I'm really curious. Let me get a clamp on ammeter on this thing. And just put it around the... Uh, the hot wire, which in this case is the red. Put that on the 4 amp scale. All right. Uh, see if I can do this so the, the light doesn't glare on it too much. Watch the watch the readings on the ammeter here. The surge, when it first powered up, went to almost a full amp here. They come to a complete stop. Yeah, it was almost like 0.8 amps on startup. So, considering it's that's a free running, uh, free running uh, situation, there's no load on the motor. Um, I'm saying this motor is probably really healthy because it's rated at 0.9 ampere. Uh, and my guess is that under load, uh, that's what she's going to pull. So, anyway, yeah. So what did we learn? Uh, well, number one, we learned that when other people get their fingers into something before you get there, it's not necessarily going to be put back together correctly. Um, and that's just a fact of life. I'm going to get these gloves off. Uh, that's just a fact of life. It's going to happen. And uh, so what do you do about it? Well, you let experience be your teacher. And the more motors you take apart where you're the first person to get your paws in there, the more you'll know how these things are supposed to be put together. Now this was missing hardware inside. Um, there was those, the spacers that I made out of brass washers were probably originally um, some sort of a fiber washer inside uh, that was used for adjustment. But obviously the connection plate 
uh, portion of the connection portion of the commutators was rubbing up against the um, the brush holder plate on the first time we ran this motor. So yeah, that was uh, I'll call it delightful, just to be just to be polite. But anyway, we were able to fix it. Um, it took time. I'm looking at right now. Since I started this run of the clock, it's been an hour and 21 minutes. It's not going to be that in the edited version. I'm going to trim a lot of this out. But yeah, it was, it was a pain in the neck. Was it worth it? Well, as an educational exercise, it's always worth it. Always worth it. Um, is, an, is a Delco appliance division of General Motors Corporation, Rochester, New York, sewing machine motor, uh, any more valuable than any other motor? Hell no. Unless somebody's a die-hard AC Delco uh, collector. No, it's not. But a lot of these motors wound up on earlier machines, mostly 66s and 15-30s and the like, and well, probably a lot of vibrating shuttle machines as well. Machines that were made back when those machines were originally just either hand cranked or treadle, uh, but at a point in time where at least there was a motor boss, and the motor boss would have been there originally as a hand crank boss. You know, a place to attach the hand crank. So yeah, you 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 might run into one of these. If you want to restore one, is it worth the effort? Eh, I guess. You know, that's up to you. Uh, I did this as a, as an exercise. I did not do this with the intention of putting this motor back into service. But now this motor is running well enough. I'll probably wind up taking it apart again, taking off the name plate. Um, cleaning off all the paint from the, the body, taking the, um, the bracket and cleaning it up, and then repainting the motor body and the bracket and everything, and then reattaching the nameplate because it runs so well. Granted, I do have to find another nut in whatever thread that is. I have to measure those threads, I suspect, because it it's not 1032. I suspect it's uh, excuse me, 632. I suspect that it's either 628 or 624, which is going to be a pain in the neck to find. But, you know, I'll come across something, I am sure. But anyway, that's what I've got for you. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I know this one was painful. And um, we'll see you on the next video.